let's begin with some texture coordinates, a UV map node. Let's get a preview of that map. Turn off the world lighting just to speed things up. Let's add a UV distance node. And there's our gradient. We're getting a gradient with a radius of 0.5 because our plane is one by one. Reflected in the center point of the gradient being 0.5 and 0.5. I'll leave it at 0.5 for both U and V. Let's drop in a math node, set to subtract. Let's duplicate that node and swap the noodle into the bottom socket. You can see what we're doing here. We've got an inverse of the gradient we've created. Let's duplicate this math node and set the operation to divide. We'll turn clamp on this time. And we'll use this input to control the size of this gradient, the fall off of the gradient essentially. And this control will be for the radius. We'll do the same for the V component. And let's drop in some fader nodes to control these values. This one will control the radius, and this one will control the size of the edge, essentially. Let's drop that down. Now we can add these results together to get a result a little something like that. And now when we invert the gradient by subtracting it from 1, we've got our ring. We can control the size of the radius and the size of the edge. Set that back to default, 0.5 and 0.1. Let's go a little further. We can add a value curve node. Now we'll multiply the result of the curve node by the size of the edge. And now that we're talking about sizes, let's get a better idea of what's going on by having a look at the actual displacement. goes into height with a mid level of zero. And turn the world lighting back on. Looking pretty good. Let's see the controls we have created so far. We've got our soft edge control. We've got the edge size control right there. And the radius of the ring. One more thing we can do right here in the chain is to add a multiplication control of this output because, let me show you with a fader node, I'm going to set this to zero. When we remove this addition, we change the torus into a disk, the torus, the ring, call it what you will. Now we have a morph control between disk and torus. And as always, we can control the center point of the ring itself right here. Set that back to 0 0.5. Going to move everything over to the left a little bit. Let's get a mask for this ring. I'm going to duplicate this subtract node, move it up a little, and I'll set it to, first I'll swap the noodle into the top input. Set it to greater than with a threshold of zero. Let's see what I've got. No, I need the inverse of this. So that'll be less than one. And there we go. We got our mask showing us the ring or the torus. And correctly so. Moving on. Let me go back to the principal shader. There we go. We can add some extrusion and tilt controls, which will be familiar from the brick setup, the UV brick. I use the UV map node. I'll duplicate that node for simplicity's sake. Split apart the vector with a separate XYZ. And I'm going to be using the Y channel. I'll use a fader node to control the size. And I'll add that with a math node to the height result. There we go. Now we're getting unwanted displacement in the areas around and in the center of the ring. 
So to remove all of that, we can use the mask output. We'll drop in a math node set to multiply at the very end of the chain and multiply everything by our mask. That looks a lot better. We can reduce the size of that tilt. Now we should introduce a way to flip the tilt. Maybe we want to tilt it the other way, an inversion control. Move everything over here to the right a little bit. I'm going to drop in a value mix node, drop it onto this noodle and connect the Y component into the bottom socket as well. But the bottom one, we're going to invert with a math node, subtract and subtract the result of the Y component from one. Now I can turn the tilt up a little bit and with this control, I can invert the direction. Everything else still works. Turn the soft edges on and off as you wish. Blend back and forth between a disc and a torus and the edge and radius controls over here. Final thing to add is a simple extrusion, very similar to what we've done here, but simply minus the gradient part. So let's get our fader node right there. We'll duplicate the add node, connect them up, and we've got our simple extrusion. Turn the tilt off, extrusion off. And with that, we are done. We have created a UV disk. So let's wrap it up in a node. I'm going to tie together these two noodles and these three noodles. Now I'll select everything, excluding the principal shader, etc. over here, obviously. And as far left as the UV distance and the reroutes. So we don't want these three here included. That's the UV map and the two fader nodes. Control G to make our group. Let's line them up nice and tidily. And we can address our inputs. So the input vector will be fine the way it is. Let me drag this back over here. These two inputs will be our radius and our edge size, or possibly just edge if you prefer. I think I will radius and edge. Now we have the center point controls here. We're going to expose them as simple value inputs. I'll move them up to be just under the vector like that. And CU and CV will do as names. Let's duplicate the group input and drop it here right next to this fader which is our disk slash torus blend. So I'm going to call it torus because it will give you the torus when set to one and the disk when set to zero. So I'll call it the torus effect. I'm going to move these nodes down just a touch because I need a little more space for this input, which I'm going to drop here. And this curve controls our soft edges. Again, familiar from the bricks. Soft edges. The flip controls we will name as such. This is the direction control or the flip control. And this would be the tilt intensity. So we will connect this one first, and I'll call this tilt, short for tilt amount, I guess. Now I'll connect this one, I'll set it to a default of zero, below the tilt, and I'll call it tilt flip. Duplicate the group input node one more time. Hook this up and we'll call it extrusion. And I'm actually going to move extrusion above tilt, I think. And there we go. We might also want to access the mask from outside, so I'll expose that one. First, I'll name this existing value to height. And then 
connect the mask, name it as such, and I'm going to move it to the top. And there we go. Oh, that's untidy. Let's fix that. No. Let's have a look from the outside and see what we've got. First, we'll give it its name, UV Disk. And we'll keep it forever. We don't need our fader nodes anymore because they're built into the node itself, but we do need some texture coordinates. Let's drag everything back over here and fix our defaults because there's clearly something a little bit wrong. The center values are fine, 0.5 will work. I'm going to set the radius back to 0.5 and the edge 2.1. There we go. I'm going to leave Taurus switched on, I think, as the default, and soft edges on as well. Extrusion to zero and tilt to zero. So let's actually set those defaults. Center U and V are already set. Radius I set to 0.5. Edge to 0.1. Torus I left at 1. Soft edge is at 1. And everything else is already correct. So with that, the UV disk is officially finished. Now then. Actually, before we go any further, I think I forgot, in fact, there. Okay, that needs to be swapped out for the input vector. Very simple. Okay. And with that, the node is done. And we can start building some materials. So let's move it over to the left a little bit. We'll make some room and drop in a UV grid node using the normalized output, even though that is very cool. Normalized and make a little more room. Now, in terms of height, we have to account for the tile size here because we're using the normalized output. We have a tile size of 0.1, so I'll add a math node set to multiply by 0.1. I'm reasonably happy that my heights are going to be correct, so I'm going to swap the displacement setup for a bump setup just to make things a little more snappy. Vector bump connected to the normals, and we'll use Eevee. Now then, our rings are a little too big for their tile, and that's because we're using the normalized output. We have a radius of 0.5 and then an edge of 0.1. So if we subtract the edge from the radius, leaving us 0.4, we get our rings fitting perfectly into their tiles. We can now transform the rings into disks as such and let's give them a little tilt as a matter of fact to see the tilt i'm going to go back to displacement forgive the back and forth i changed my mind quite a bit mid level of zero and use a cycles preview turn on the subdivision i'm going to need a little more subdivision there we go now then, the tilt functions. Let's flip the tilt. There we go. Okay. I'll move that in a little closer. I'm going to use a value input node for the sizes here. Currently 0.1, both width and height. And now also the height adjustment multiplication here at the end. I'm going to move the value node over to the left a little bit and select these four nodes, Control, Shift, and D, to duplicate them and keep the incoming connections. Now I'm going to move this duplicate UV map over to the left a little, giving me room for a vector math node. And into the X and Y of the vector, I'm going to add half of my tile size, 0 0.05. Now let's check the original preview that's what that looks like our altered preview looks like that 
And now if I combine both of these layers with a math node set to maximum, we get a scales-like effect. Call it fish scales, dragon scales, or possibly a round roof tile. I'll turn the subdivision down briefly and I'm going to change this arrangement here. I'm going to introduce a separate height control. So we have individual controls over width and height. Turn off the preview for a second and I'm going to simply disconnect all the noodles so I can connect this top value node to both of my width inputs, the bottom to the height. And now we have to decide which of the two to use to control the height manipulations here at the end. We'll very simply choose the smaller of the two. We'll use a math node and we'll set it to minimum. Connect both of the input nodes and we'll use that result to control our multiplies. And now if I increase the vertical size, you'll see that the tiles get stretched and we have to address the offset values as well. These offset values were half of the relative size input, be it width or height. We'll obtain half of these values with multiply nodes set to 0.5, which is the same as dividing by 2. We'll combine the two results into a vector and apply that vector to our addition right here. I'll move these nodes over to the side just a little bit. And now I can comfortably change tile size and the offsets get updated automatically by my multiplication nodes. Very nice. Now, I want to introduce a feature which will account for differences in these two sizes. For example, if I make my tiles taller than they are wide, the tiles get stretched. Now, that makes sense, but I might want to use the tile size to introduce space around these, uh, these tiles, these scales, whatever you want to call them. And to do that, I'm going to introduce a new feature to the UV grid node itself, possibly the last feature. We're going to come down here to these main mathematical operations that we carry out on the input vector. We'll need a group input node and a number of math nodes set to divide with clamp turned on. For the first one, I'm going to divide the height by the width. And now I'm going to duplicate that node and keep the connection so I can simply swap them over. So here we have height divided by width, and here we have width divided by height. The next math nodes will be some multiply nodes, which we're going to use to control this effect. So I'll do it for both of the channels. And now all I have to do is divide these two results coming from the divide nodes by these results. So I'll divide the x result by this output, set it to divide, hook up the multiply. I'm going to actually minimize this divide node, duplicate that one and drop it onto the Y noodle. Hook up my second multiply node. And now from the outside, you'll see that I can increase the size of the cells of the UV grid, but the size of the tiles does not change. As a matter of fact, to account for the difference in size, you'll see the UV grid introduces padding. For example, if the horizontal, if the width input is smaller than the vertical, it will introduce padding along the vertical to account for the difference in size. And then if I bring the width up to exceed the height, it introduces the same padding, but horizontally. Very nice. So I'll set my width to 0.1 and the height to about 0.13, something like that, maybe 0.14. Move them apart a little bit more. And let me just adjust this offset right here. If I remove the Y entirely, no, I'm going to keep the Y and I'm going to remove the X. There we go. That stacks my tiles up one on top of the other. And now I'm going to create two new layers. I'm going to duplicate these layers, add two new layers to the mix, and I'm going to move the new layers right by the value of half of tile width. And then I'll move along the Y axis up by 0.25 and down by 0.25, giving me an offset of 0.25 and 0.75. And you'll see very soon exactly why. Let's duplicate these layers. And I'll move them down a bit. Let's see the output of this layer. It's the same as the first. 
I'm going to move this UV map over a little bit because I need to introduce an offset like I did here, which I'll do with an add node. So duplicate the add, why not? I'll disconnect these offsets and I'll get myself a copy of the X offset. There we go. So now this is my X, this is my Y. Both set to multiply by 0.5. We'll use some combine X, Y, Z nodes to change these offsets into vectors. And both of these offsets along the X axis get half the tile size. So I'll hook that up. Now I need two individual versions of the Y offset. And as I said before, the first one is 0.25 instead of 0.5 and the second 0.75. Now watch what happens when I connect these offsets to the Y channels. We go back to something we recognize, but this time we've got an offset of 0.5 in both directions. Meaning that if I take all of the layers, all four layers, and combine them with a final maximum node, we get a dense network of tessellating scales which overlap vertically. We can control the spacing making the scales bigger or spreading them apart as we see fit. Height as well. And the scales or tiles, whichever way you want to look at them, will remain perfectly circular. The edges and the space offsets will not be changed. Furthermore, you have the controls in the new UV disk node to play with and make changes. So let's select all four of them. And now I can hold Alt as I make changes to apply the same change to all four nodes. You'll see that I can turn soft edges off, and that affects all the layers. Let's get a little more resolution. I can turn torus on for all of the layers. That looks interesting. Let's turn soft edges back on. And now let's select the last two UV disk nodes, and we'll flip the tilt. And would you look at that? We've just made some chain mail. Let's grab all four UV disks and make these uh, intersecting areas match a little better. First, I'm going to come up to my Y size right here and reduce that a little bit. I'm going to squeeze the rings in together a little bit more. 0.23, that'll do. And now I'll compensate for the extra space with just a little more edge thickness. Currently 0.1. Let's try 0.12. That'll work. And because I've increased the edge size, I should decrease the radius. I'm going to enter very simply 0.5 minus 0.12, which is my edge size. And there we go. Now the rings fit comfortably into their tiles. This is chainmail, so we'll turn metallic up. We'll change the color a little bit, make it brighter and ever so slightly blue. Turn the roughness down, specular up a little bit, and the IOR 2.65, something like that. There we go, we got some nice looking metal. Now let's separate the chainmail rings from their background. We need some masks. So let's just grab the mask outputs from all four of the UV disks and add them together. Simple as that. So math nodes set to add layer one and layer two layer 3 and layer 4, and duplicate that add node, and there's our mask. So let's use that mask to control some mix nodes, both color and value. As a matter of fact, I'm going to turn on clamp as well, so just to make sure I don't exceed 1. I'll set the background color to significantly darker. Okay. Now some value mix nodes to control things like specular, IOR, and roughness. The first one will indeed be specular. The first value being the background, I'll set it to 0.5. No, I'll set it lower, 0.2 and 0.6 for the metal. The roughness of the background, I'll set very high, 0.8 and 0.182, as I currently have set here. Got the specular and one final mix node 
for the IOR. We'll use the standard 1.45 for the background and 2.65 for the metal. How about that? Let's see what that looks like in a bump version as opposed to displacement. Turn off the preview. Check it out in Eevee. Nice and quick to compile and looking very nice. And just before we call this node done, let's come back over to UV Grid and introduce a way to switch this function off when not desired. The way we're going to remove it from the mix is to replace the result of these. Actually, these multiply nodes are no longer necessary, so I'm going to get rid of them. And I'm going to change to a cycles preview just to avoid the constant refreshes. To deactivate this function, we're going to divide by one here instead of dividing by the result of these divide nodes. I'll do that with some value mix. The result of the divide node goes into the bottom input and the top input I'll set to one. I'm going to switch to zero for a zero default. So this function, which I'll call square, will actually be off by default. Swap the noodle into the bottom. Whoops. Let's try that again. There we go. Value one to one. And now I'll use one of these factor sliders to create the input and have the input control both of the mixes. Final step is to change the slider into a switch with a math node. Operation greater than threshold of 0.5. Now let's see what we got from the outside. First, let me give that factor a name so we know what it is. Square, and now from the outside, square is currently switched off. And the tiles, in fact, are stretched, as you would expect. Let me grab all of the UV grid nodes and alt and drag to switch square on. And there we have our squared tiles and our perfectly round links back, bringing back our chainmail. And with that, the UV grid node is almost, almost finished. <laughs> the very last thing I want to do to the node is simply to rearrange the inputs a little bit. I think it makes sense for a random seed to be at the very bottom. And I would place square immediately after the width and the height inputs. It just makes more sense to my mind. With that, the UV grid node is complete. And this series is very nearly complete, really. The only thing I have to add is possibly one more video of random experiments of things that I've come up with while developing the UV node and putting together this series. I think there will be one more video and I think it will be the last. If you've followed through the whole series, I really hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it very useful. If you followed the series, if you've learned anything from me, I am very, very happy to hear it. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take it easy.